welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee, and we are continuing our discussions on S-119. And uh, we all should have draft 4.1, um, as well as a side-by-side. -side. And um, thank you again, Bryn, for, for getting this to us so, so yesterday. Um, so I think what I'd like to do, um, we are gonna, as we had planned to take a vote today, but I'd like Bryn to, to walk us through 4.1. Um, and just uh, briefly tell us what is uh, what's here, what, you know, for the most part, what isn't here. And just so, we, so we're clear on what we'll be voting on. Okay, sure thing. <clears throat> Should I get started? Is it, I, I know, Bryn, I know you emailed it to us, but I'm just wondering if it's on our page also. It is. Great, thank you. Sorry, that was for Bryn, but I just <laughs> called it up so I knew that it was there. So good morning committee for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, does the committee have a preference? I think my, I, my plan was to walk through the, um, the amendment itself as opposed to the side by side. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. So it is a clean version of draft 4.1 of your amendment to S119. So it, I don't, doesn't have the typical yellow highlighting in it. So I'm just gonna draw your attention to the changes um, that you made based on the last draft that you went through, which was 3.5. Um, so I'll start on page one. Um, nothing changed here. You remember that you talked about, um, you did talk about the, the definition of force, but um, didn't wind up making any changes to that. So the first change is at the top of page two, and this is um, actually a part of the imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury definition. So um, if you recall, the, the, that definition initially ended with the word instantly confronted and addressed. So um, if, that, if, a, if a threat was imminent, it, it can't just be a, there can't just be a fear of future harm. It has to be a, has to be a harm that has to be um, immediately addressed and confronted. That's how the committee changed those words as opposed to instantly confronted and addressed. And if you recall, that was really to, um, that change was made to more closely align those words with the uh, um, jurisprudence regarding imminent threat. So we changed that to immediately. And then you just swapped the order of addressed and confronted. Um, the next change is a little lower down on that page, the definition of prohibited restraint. Um, draft 3.5 removed the word may from that definition. So it read um, the use of any maneuver that applies pressure to the neck, throat, windpipe, or carotid artery that prevents or hinders breathing. Um, but you had some discussion about that and we've um, reverted back to the original definition there. And that's also the definition um, that passed in S219 earlier in the summer. So now it's consistent with how it was in S219. Um, the next change that you made, I'm just gonna keep rolling through unless I see people with questions, is in the totality of the circumstances definition. You added a few words there um, on line 11. So it means the conduct and decisions of law enforcement officer leading up to the use of force. And then all facts known or reasonably available to the law enforcement officer at the time. So um, that was based on a conversation, um, I believe it was the Attorney General's office about wanting to include some um, sp specific directive that um, it had to include sort of what reasonably should have been known to the officer at the time, not just what the officer actually did know. So to make that abundantly clear, um, we added those words or reasonably available to the law enforcement officer at the time. So now I'm gonna, um, that's it for the definition section. Um, there are some changes in subsection B, use of force. Um, the first one I believe is on page uh, three, bottom of page three is subsection five. And um, that is that language that um, Representative Lalonde substituted for the former language that was there about um, whether the subject's conduct was the result of um, some sort of impairment or language barrier or limitation. Um, and if you recall, this language was, there, a version of this language is, was in 3.5, but this language was the substitute language offered by Representative Lalonde that provides that if a law enforcement officer knew or reasonably should have known that the subject's conduct was the result of one of these factors, 
um, the officer has to take that into account in determining whether or not to use force on a subject or the amount of force that's appropriate to use on that subject. So that's new language there <clears throat> from the last draft. So that, that's it for the changes to subsection B. I'm gonna move on now to subsection C, the use of deadly force. Um, so I'm on page five now. Subsection three under sub, subdivision B uh, or C. So this is the language that law enforcement officers have to stop using deadly force once the subject is under um, the officer's control. So the wording here has been changed a little bit um, in order to make it more closely aligned with the actual standard for law enforcement use of deadly force. So we provide um, the deadly force has to cease as soon as the subject is under the officer's control or no longer poses an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer. Um, so that makes that language more closely aligned with the standards set out in C1A and C1B. Um, and then the last change is something that's not there. The last change to the standards for um, law enforcement use of force. Subdivision eight um, is no longer there on page five. That was um, that language that provided um, some, some explicit language about law enforcement not using, losing the right to self-defense or um, the defense of justifiable homicide as long as their use of force was in compliance with this, um, these standards. So instead what you've done is you've um, made the change that you see in section two. So that subdivision eight is gone, but instead we have some new language in section two, which you'll see on page six. This is the justifiable homicide statute. Um, you remember you made quite a few changes to update this statute. And also you amended um, subdivision three on page six. So this is the new language that applies to law enforcement. Um, so it provides that if a law enforcement officer who wounds or kills someone shall be guiltless in the case of law enforcement using force in compliance with the standards as set forth in 20 VSA 2368 B2, 4, and 5, or the use of deadly force in compliance with 20 VSA 2368 C1 through 4. Um, and we went through those specific subdivisions yesterday. I don't think we talked about, um, we talked about C, the use of deadly force, what those provisions refer to exactly. Um, I don't think we talked about B so much because um, we've added these. This is a little different than um, what we talked about. So we're cross-referencing the use of force standard in B2, that's the standard, and then B4 and five. And B4 and five are just to remind you um, that substitute language that we just talked about, law, imposing that burden on law enforcement to consider um, whether or not a subject's conduct is due to those factors outside the subject's control. And four is um, that language that talks about when law enforcement officer, a, a decision by a law enforcement officer to use force um, is objectively reasonable and it has to be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of the circumstances. So it kind of um, puts some parameters on that objectively reasonable analysis. I know I'm going pretty quickly, but does that, does that make sense? I'm gonna, I'll move on from that um, justifiable homicide unless I see some questions. Okay. So um, no changes to section three. This is just a reminder, section three um, repeals the repeals that 219 put into place. So if you remember 219 repealed um, that new crime of law enforcement use of prohibited restraint in July of next year, um, we've repealed that repeal. So it will essentially the, um, that new crime will no longer sunset next July. And then um, 219 also repealed that subdivision three of justifiable homicide on the same date. Um, and we've repealed that repeal since this bill, S-119, amends that language in justifiable homicide statute. Sorry about my phone ringing. Um, I'm on page seven now. Um, this is 
uh, the next change to the draft is on page seven. This is the new section um, that provides the directive to DPS um, to report to the standing committees um, on or before February 2nd of next year about their development of that uniform statewide uh, law enforcement use of force policy as directed by the executive order. And it specifically says that that report has to include both information about the process that was undertaken by DPS and the executive director of racial equity, including a list of the um, community representatives uh, and other stakeholders that were included in the process, um, the number of times that the stakeholders all met and any opportunities given for public comment or participation in the outcome of that um, process. And then finally, um, the actual final proposed policy. So I think that you went over, I don't think I was with the committee when you went over that language initially yesterday, but that's the same language that you looked at yesterday that was posted uh, to your committee webpage. And then lastly, section five is the effective date section and you've changed the effective date for the standards um, set out in section one to July 1st of 2021. And you talked about that um, giving some time to law enforcement to um, adjust their, uh, their training to the new standards set out um, for their use of force. Thank you. Excuse me, Barbara. Thanks. So, Bryn, I just want to make sure I understand. So nothing in this bill will take effect before July 1st. So if somebody used um, deadly force before July 1st, but after this bill passed, they wouldn't be subject to anything in this. Right, so the standards, the standards um, don't take effect until July. That's right. So um, that wouldn't be impact. The outcome of that wouldn't be impacted until July when those standards take effect. Okay, thanks. I kind of thought so, but just wanted to. Um, you know, as that, thank you for that question because it made me realize I do think that we should also include. Um, Section two in this effective date. This, I think section two should also take effect July 1st, because if you remember, that's the section that amends justifiable homicide um, to line up with the new standards. So I think it might make sense to make delay that effective date as well to July when the standards take effect. Sorry about that. Just noticing that. And it, it, isn't, it isn't appropriate to say while this doesn't take effect until then, this is what the legislature expects. Like, I, I just would hate to, I mean, I don't know. I, I hate to see uh, deadly force use between now and, and July 1st in some way and not have been able to impact that. Can I respond to that real quickly? Um, well, Selena had her hand up. Yeah, yeah she's, she's going to respond to that. That's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, uh, my, I'm, my question for Bryn is a little different, so I think it might make okay. more sense. Okay, Mark. So, so the main thing is that uh, there are standards that are going to be in place. They're, they're in the uh, case law, the Second Circuit and Vermont. And again, our standards are not that different from what is currently in case law. Is, is my understanding and Bryn can confirm that. It's not like we're doing radical changes. We are codifying that. And I think we're clarifying some parts, but it's not like they're standardless until, until July 1st. Um, I, I, I would agree with that. I would say that there, I do think there's an incremental shift away from the, from the established case law about use of force by adding the word necessary, but, um, you know, I agree that there's many parts of of these standards that do codify existing existing case law about um, law enforcement use of force. Selena, um, yeah, I was going to just ask Bryn if you could remind us which of the because I think there are a number of provisions in S two nineteen that go into effect um, next month, right? With uh, uh, the October first effective date. Right. Um, so I, I, I'm, I guess I'm sort of seeing that we, we are making, it's not like we're not making any progress until 
July 1, we're allowing officers to train, to, you know, giving them a fair shot at training to these standards, but there, there is, there are some big shifts coming in the interim. So can you just remind us what those are? Sure. Um, so that the new crime regarding law enforcement use of a prohibited restraint, um, and also the, if you remember that language that was added to the unprofessional conduct chapter of Title 20, um, that provided that um, the use of a prohibited restraint was considered unprofessional conduct and also um, failure to intervene and report if an officer observes another officer placing a person in a prohibited restraint or using excessive force. Um, <clears throat> all of those provisions take effect on October. I'm just confirming that that's true. Um, take effect on October 1st or September 1st. So part, either they're already in effect or they will take effect on October 1st. And also the requirement about um, equipping officers with uh, body cameras takes effect on October 1st. And then can you remind me, um, because in S219, I think we had a repeal of the Right. Uh, a portion of the justifiable homicide statute that we're actually here amending to um, point back to these um, use of force and use of deadly force standards. So can you remind me where, when and how that is slated for repeal in our, in the yeah. laws that we've already passed? Yeah, so 219 um, sort of put a sunset on both the new crime of prohibited restraint, law enforcement use of prohibited restraint, and also that um, subsection three of the justifiable homicide statute, both of those were scheduled to sunset in July of next year in 219. Yeah. But this bill, one your amendment here um, in section uh, three repeals both of those sunsets. So- um, Got it, yeah, okay. I appreciate, sure. appreciate that. <laughs> That's very helpful. Just keep track of all that. Yeah. So, so Bryn, in terms of adding um, the effective date, would it be something like um, Section 1, Standards for Law Enforcement, Use of Force, and Section 2? Exactly. I would just add that um, and Section 2, Justifiable Homicide, shall take effect on July 1st. And if it's helpful, and I know the committee's on a timeline, if it's helpful, I can just make that change, save it as a new draft and send it to Lori and the committee now. Sure. Okay. Great. Uh, Tom, your hand is up, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. That's all right, it just went up. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, section two, right at the end of section two, um, page six, lines 10 through 13. Is that uh, what we passed earlier in the year and put the sunset on? For anyone? <laughs> I'm sorry, here, here I am. Section two yeah. lines, tell me again the lines you're talking about. Uh, it's uh, uh, the end of page, uh, the end of section two on page six. Uh, lines 10 through 13. Is, is that what we passed uh, earlier in the year and put the sense, sunset on for further discussion? So you didn't, you're making that amendment to subsection three in this bill. So you, 219 didn't amend this language. It just put a sunset on the original language, the struck through language. It just put a sunset on that. So we're taking, a, we're repealing that sunset because instead of sunsetting this section, You've changed it, um, so it's um, no longer potentially unconstitutional language, and instead it provides that law enforcement um, provides a defense for law enforcement as long as their use of force or deadly force was in compliance with the new standards that you've created in this. Okay, uh, so so I can try to understand it a little more. So this is. Uh, what we passed earlier in the year for the new uh, the new crime around uh, uh, police officers has been um, um, 
I, I guess, uh, eliminated more or less, and we amended it to this new language? The, so the new crime is, is still there in 219. Okay. But what 219 did is you put a sunset on that new crime, and you put a sunset on this defense. Yeah. Um, with the idea that you would return to it, think more about it in either this session or the next session. So what you've done in this bill is you've, um, if you remember, you've had you you had the new crime in this bill a few times, um, thinking about how to handle the defense. And what you've settled on here is in the justifiable homicide statute, amending that language rather than sunsetting it to provide a defense for law enforcement if they use deadly force or, or force as long as it's in compliance with those standards that you've created in section one. And specifically those standards for deadly force C1 through four. So it doesn't include um, the provision in subdivision C about the prohibited restraint. So as long as a law enforcement officer is using force and compliance with C1 through, C1 through four, then they can use the justifiable homicide defense as a defense. Okay, great, thank you. And so the struck language is, is what was um, potentially unconstitutional and that's, that's taken out here. And so that's why that's part of the reason why we don't need to repeal it because we took it out here. That's right, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, Martin. So uh, I didn't really have a question. I don't know if we're at the point that there's just one point that I wanted to make and, and it's a broader point as opposed to any kind of specific language. And I don't know if we're, we're ready for that kind of discussion now or if I should hold off, make sure that nobody else has other questions about the bill itself. Uh, yeah, why don't we see if there are any questions pertaining to to this draft? Are you, are you suggesting an amendment? Is that where? No, no, it's 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 no. a timing issue, and, and it's okay. almost an issue for for us of why we should pass this now, and hopefully the message will get to the Senate of why we should pass this now. Okay, um, let me before we do that, let me see. If, uh, let's see any other questions and. Um, Okay, and then Bryn, let us know when, when you're ready with the next draft. Um, okay, go ahead, Martin. It, it's a relatively straightforward point. Um, the policy making process is kicked off already with the uh, governor's executive order. And even before that, I know that DPS has been working on a policy. Uh, and if we postpone putting these standards into place, the policy is going to be getting developed without the guidance of the standards that we want uh, it for use of force and use of deadly force. So I think it's critical just timing wise that we get these standards out so that this policy development process that's already kicked off uh, has these standards to, to guide it. So and, and, uh, and hopefully that message definitely gets to the Senate for why we shouldn't be uh, postponing action on, on this bill. Okay. Uh, Coach. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would support that. Uh, it's, it, uh, it is a technical uh, concern uh, as far as process. Um, and without those uh, guardrails for them to frame uh, their work, we could end up in a situation uh, that none of us are happy with. So I, I would support um, uh, Martin's suggestion. Yeah. Anybody else? Tom. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we're going to go over the side by side. If, if, would you like to? We, we can. Yeah, yeah, I, I would. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and we are we um, we are stopping at 915 
voting before then, but yes, okay. So, so I did just send the committee the um, draft 5.1. The only okay. change to that draft is the fix and the effective dates to make section two, the justifiable homicide statute effective um, at the same time as the standards uh, take effect, which is July 1st of next year. Great, thank you. And Lori, if you could post it as well, that'd be great. Um, okay, so um, yes, Bryn, if you could walk us uh, through the side-by-side. -side. Um, sure. Go ahead. So the side-by-side -side, um, dated September 17th. So um, it compares the Senate passed version to House Judiciary Draft 4.1. So that's the version we just walked through. Again, the only change from Draft 5.1 is the change in the effective date. Um, so I tried to highlight every all of the differences between the drafts. There are a couple of places where it's tricky and there's not highlight because essentially the language was just rearranged. Um, but I try and make a note of that in the notes section. So section one, you can see that um, you've changed the you've um, change the title of this new section of law to be standards for law enforcement use of force rather than a statewide policy about law enforcement use of deadly force since you've expanded it to include use of force as well. You added the definition of force to mean the physical coercion employed by law enforcement to compel a person's compliance with the officer's instructions. Um, the imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury is largely the same except for the um, change that you made in the last sentence which you see um, on the next page, I think that's page two, um, that um, it's a threat that must be immediately addressed and confronted as opposed to instantly confronted and addressed. Um, the definition of law enforcement officer and prohibited restraint remains the same. Definition on page four of totality of the circumstances, we've got some changes here. Um, the, the, Significant change is to include that clause about um, whether a medical condition or some other type of impairment um, or other factor beyond the subject's control uh, is interfering with the subject's ability to understand or comply with law enforcement commands. It has to be explicitly a part of the analysis of what the totality of the circumstances is. And then I'm on page five now. You can see use of force. Um, you've changed that subdivision heading to use of force as opposed to statewide policy because you get into some more specifics about um, the standard for law enforcement use of force generally. Um, Excuse me, I see this. Um, sorry, I can, it looks like you have a question. Yeah, way back at the beginning, I'm sorry, but um, right at the very beginning, section one where the Senate uh, has, I thought that word policy is a big deal when we're talking about uh, different things. Like policy is in on the Senate side, but it's not, we have standards for law enforcement. Yes. Why don't we have standard policy? Why is it that word in there? So if you remember, you changed that wording um, to make it clear that what you were what you were doing in the statute wasn't setting forth a comprehensive policy. Policy is typically um, a much more comprehensive set of uh, directives. And what you're doing here is instead creating sort of a floor of standards um, for law enforcement use of force set out in statute. So you're not, um, you're not creating that, that uh, long, um, more fleshed out uh, policy that law enforcement is going to do for themselves um, in section four. Okay, thank Again, you. Yeah, right. And again, that's because um, uh, with the governor's executive order that is already in play and started out and also um, S-124 um, addresses that as well. So. Thank you. So if I'm now on page five, <clears throat> this is subdivision B2. This is the language that sets out the standard for law enforcement use of force. The language looks different from the Senate version, but it's um, much of it comes from the Senate version B5. 
Um, and you've also added some language um, on page six. So law enforcement may use this force to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective. So the, this, that language sort of provides for an, a, an expanded set of circumstances um, under which law enforcement may use force as long as it's in compliance um, with the standard. So as long as it's objectively reasonable, necessary, and proportional. Um, I'm now on page seven, subsection four. This talks about the decision by law enforcement um, to use force, whether it's objectively reasonable, has to be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer. And then we've added a sentence, the house version adds a sentence that law enforcement's failure to use feasible and reasonable alternatives to force shall be a consideration for whether its use was objectively reasonable. Adding some more um, parameters there. Can I comment on that just real quickly, just to have, help folks remember and, and remind me if, tell me if I'm wrong about that. This is language that uh, Ann Donahue had suggested, right? Is this that language? It's very similar to the language she suggested, yeah. yes. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so now I'm moving down to page eight and you'll see the Senate version on the left-hand column five is highlighted. Um, it doesn't appear in the same place, but again, um, you've moved it to subsection B2, which is the law enforcement standard for use of force. Um, your subdivision, subsection five, middle column is new language. Um, and that's what we just went through in draft uh, 4.1, that language about imposing a duty on law enforcement to take into consideration um, the information regarding whether or not a subject's conduct is due to a factor outside of this, outside of his or her control. So that's new from the Senate version. I'm on page nine now. So subsection six in the middle column, um, this is language that provides that um, a law enforcement need not retreat or desist from their efforts um, and sh shall not be deemed an aggressor or lose their right to self-defense by the use of proportional force if it's necessary in compliance with the standards. So that language is um, also in the Senate version, but they had it under subsection C. You moved it here to B to make it clear that this applies to all law enforcement use of force and not just their use of deadly force. So I'm scrolling down here to page 10. Now we're in the use of deadly force section, subsection, subsection C. Um, so we, you see some highlighted words there in the left-hand column about what the officer reasonably believed. And that was removed in your version of C1, just because that is really redundant language um, because it's that reasonable belief language is within the definition section, which governs this whole, this whole section of the policy. And apart from that, that's the only difference between C1 Senate version and house version. So I'm scrolling down to page 11 now. Um, Subsection two on page 11, the use of deadly force is necessary. This is that language that um, describes what the word necessary means in context of law enforcement use of deadly force standard. So if you remember this um, language was in the California bill as it was introduced, it was taken out um, as it passed. But um, again, I believe you heard from several witnesses including Will DeWight that this uh, definition or explanation of the word necessary was a, was a critical piece. Scrolling down now to page 12, you see that new language in subsection three that we just talked about when law enforcement officer has to cease the use of deadly force. Um, that language is also not found in the Senate version. Um, and then Top of page, or bottom of page 12, middle of page 13, you see those subdivisions four and five are highlighted. Those are the sections that say that law enforcement can't use deadly force on a person based on the danger that that person poses to themselves. Um, and when feasible, law enforcement has to identify themselves prior to using force. Those sections both exist in the Senate version, they're just swapped in order. So I just highlighted this section number there. 
And then page 14, you see on the left-hand column, uh, subdivision four. Um, again, that language has just been rearranged and put moved up to section B6 in the house version. And then now I'm on page 15. Here's the provision about prohibited restraint. Um, the only change to the that you made in the house version is to split that subsection five into two separate subdivisions. Does that make sense? I'm going to keep going if everybody's okay. So section two, here's the justifiable homicide statute. <clears throat> Senate version didn't um, include this, the justifiable homicide statute. So what you've done in this bill, you've done that work to update the statute um, and modernize it and also um, provide um, a defense to law enforcement use of force that's in compliance with those standards that you've created in section one. And then I'm scrolling down to page 18, section three. Again, here's the um, repeal of those sunsets of the prohibited restraint crime as it applies to law enforcement and the justifiable homicide statute um, from S219. Again, Senate version didn't deal with that. Um, so your version does. And then lastly, section four, I'm on page 19 now. This is that directive to DPS and the executive director of racial equity to report to the standing committees on their work to create a uniform statewide use of force policy um, as directed by the executive order. And again, the Senate bill doesn't, you know, the executive order hadn't been uh, released yet at the, at the time the Senate worked on the bill. Um, so that is also different from the Senate version. And then lastly, the effective dates are on page uh, 21, last page. And again, I'll just remind you that the, the one change here is that your effective dates will read section one and section two, justifiable homicide statute and the standards for law enforcement use of force. Both will take effect on July 1st. So that's a little different than the October date set out in the Senate version. Um, but again, you have moved back that date to give some time for the um, DPS to and the executive director of racial equity to work on that uniform policy. So as you can see there, there are, um, the changes are, well, I won't comment. Um, I, <laughs> I was waiting, <laughs> but well, thank you. That's helpful and thank you Tom for asking to go to go through that. So, okay, any questions? Oh, Tom, there you go. Yeah, uh, no questions, but I didn't know if it was time for comments or not. Um, we, can, we, can do, we can do questions first, which is fine. <clears throat> so can I ask a question? So Bryn started to say something and then she decided not to say it, like, me not being a lawyer, like, and she is, like, can I ask why? Um, I just didn't want to comment on the on whether or not they were substantial changes or insubstantial changes. Um, so can I ask you if they are, or is that unethical? <laughs> I value your opinion, believe it or not. Um, you want me to chime in, or are you okay answering that? No, no, it's I, it's fine. I think that you um, the the work that you've done, I add some additional um, parameters. I think you've you've as as I mentioned in the beginning, you've you've expanded that those standards to include law enforcement use of force as opposed to just deadly force. Um, so I think that you've provided some additional guide rails here, um, and also you dealt with the justifiable homicide statute and those repeals that you that were in place in 219. So I think that's also um, substantial differences from the Senate version. Um, but I'm not making any comment on on how the Senate will feel about those changes. Well, that that's good. I appreciate that. I also appreciate in, in all the work that you did and the extra time and everything. I really do. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. So, so Tom, I know you want discussion. Um, I would also, I'd entertain a, a motion and then your discussion could be, could be part of the discussion. You know how we, yeah, how we have yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, yeah. uh, no matter what I say, I don't think things are going to change at this point, but, uh, but I just have, yeah. <laughs> So I'd move to approve draft 4.1 or are, should I be, oh, 4.5. No, I'm sorry, 5.1. 5.1 because, yeah, okay. Right. 5.1 um, of our amendment to S-119. Second. Second. No. Okay. Notter's um, the second. Okay. Um, Discussion, Tom, go ahead. I heard there is some discussion. <laughs> um, first, I want to start out by saying that uh, I know there was a lot of work done in this bill. Um, there was uh, a lot of people involved, uh, whether it's, you know, state's attorneys and prosecutors and stakeholders, uh, uh, ledge council, legislators, um, you know, that we're all involved in, in, in building this bill. And, and one thing I, I, that I, I want to say first, too, is that it, it wasn't that long ago that I would have voted for this bill. Um, just because, of, uh, you know, it, some, some beliefs and principles that I still have. And um, I, I have a different view of um, policing than I used to have because, because of my son and, and, and what he, uh, in, in a different job than he has now, certainly, but um, at least I hope, <laughs> um, and, and just the things that he goes through or went through and uh, that we've discussed about um, um, bills like this. Um, I was going to say policy, but it's, I don't look at this as policy, but um, so anyway, again, I do appreciate all the work that's been done. Um, what I would have liked to have seen while this was, you know, the, the original draft was formed, um, it would have been great if, uh, you know, public safety, you know, law enforcement was involved at that time. Um, I, I think a lot of uh, uh, issues could have been um, dealt with then. Um, again, I, I, don't, I don't know how many hours were put in on this. There, there was, I'm going to guess, you know, 50, 60 hours, just, just a wild guess, you know, that I've thought about. And it's, it's unfortunate, though, that from what I've seen, public safety has had two and a half hours approximately might be three the commissioner twice for a half hour each uh uh drew bloom uh twice for a half hour each and um i'm drawing a blank on who the third person was <laughs> but anyway I, uh, it's just that they didn't have a lot of say and and i know they still have a lot of concerns and um one entity that I don't remember coming in was the VPA. And, and they've always weighed in on stuff like this. I don't, at this point, I don't know if they were asked or, or, or not, but they, they certainly didn't testify in front of us. And, and they have some, uh, um, some real concerns, um, you know, uh, and, and I'm going to read from an email that I got um, with some of their concerns. Uh, the VPA is not arguing that, uh, use of force standard is likely to run afoul of the constitutional standard. The concern relates to the uncertainty created by new language and the disruption expense of developing new training and retraining all law enforcement. And most importantly, the VPA anticipates litigation as to what these new words mean when applied to an actual fact pattern. And another concern is that statutes are inflexible. I mean, we've heard that time and time again again, and, and they can't be changed without legislation. Um, policymakers can easily change a statewide model policy to conform to controlling case law. 
Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. It goes into California needing to change its statute because it had policing problems and that type of thing. But in, in uh, another concern, believes there's value in giving law enforcement agencies or representatives to co-create uh, uh, the policy with stakeholders. And uh, again, that's a very abbreviated uh, uh, um, version of, of what I have in front of me. And um, I'm, I don't know the word to use here, but um, in the past, our Judiciary Committee, I believe, has been um, very diligent as far as um, vetting. Um, we've been very diligent as far as not passing new laws. And, and, and I, I look at that as, as changed now. And, and, and I hope from here forward we go, that, uh, that I can feel confident that we're back to the way we used to be. And I, I mean, the, the number of times I've heard terms like uh, tight time frame, time constraints, constraints, timelines, deadlines, the end of the session is coming. That tells me things are rushed. Um, and it, it's not like I heard it once. It, it, I've heard it over and over and over again. And, and there's, um, I mean, January is not that far away to set this aside and, um, uh, and, and do what I believe. And I, know, I know other people feel differently and, and that, that's, that, that's fine, but do what I believe is our due diligence to give all the stakeholders, including DPS, um, uh, uh, the time that, that, that they deserve. Um, and since this is uh, um, affecting them the most, and, and my, my last comment is around uh, the, when, the, when the commissioner was um, testifying at one time, he had mentioned other experts that, to speak. And, and I, had, I remember saying that I would like to hear them, uh, what they had to say. And unfortunately, uh, I'm going to guess we didn't have time to hear them. Um, but these, uh, these people did testify in, in Senate. And there was a deputy director of policy for strategic planning, a deputy division director of law enforcement, both from the Council of State Governments. And they had what turns out some very, very compelling uh, testimony that the Senate heard and um, which uh, uh, made some people uh, in Senate judiciary from what I hear um, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but they uh, they have a new thought process over this whole thing. Um, and I, I just think we're rushing it. Um, the new the new laws uh, uh, really uh, irk me, I guess you could say. And I really look at this as something that should be in policy. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. I. Um, just want to respond to some of the things that you said. Um, my understanding is that Chief Pete testified on behalf of the Vermont yes. Police Association. Yes. We yep. did. Um, okay. Stephen Botney, uh, who we usually see, um, reached out to us, gosh, I think even before the session, this last session started. And, um, and I did invite her to testify. And, um, and she, um, she chose to um, to have Chief Pete um, testify in, um, instead. Um, and I know that Martin spoke quite a bit with, with Beth. Um, and, and Chief Burke also, I think both of them were on behalf of the police association. Chief, uh, yeah, so, and, and I think they were also, so the police association, the chiefs, they, they often do wear, you know, different, different hats at the same time. Right, that, that's, I apologize. That's where my mistake that's, was. No, thinking that's okay. Of, thinking that's of okay. that, so. Yeah, and then um, I think it was back in July, um, I met with um, the administration, DPS, um, uh, governor's attorney um, to go over the concerns of the, the letter when the governor signed um, 219 and looking at moving forward 
and have uh, certainly been in touch with the commissioners called me. So, so you know, no, no, no surprises here. I, I think, um, you know, in terms of what we've been doing. Uh, and the other thing is, I think in terms of the effective date, um, no, I, it'd be great to hear from Council of State Governments. You know, certainly we can go back and watch it, but given that we do have this effective date pushed out, um, in January, we can have the Council of State Governments, we can have those folks in, we can have the constitutional um, expert that the commissioner referred us to. So I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't think, you know, we're prohibited from still doing that and, and revisiting, um, uh, you know, what we've done um, getting the update from the report. So I do very much see this as an ongoing process of this work, because um, certainly we cannot address this very important work in just this one bill. Anyway. Um, Great, Selena. thank you, Maxine. Yeah, sure, thank you. Selena. Um, yeah, I think you said some of the things I was going to say, Representative Grad. I just, I, I you know, appreciate your concerns, Tom, and also the, that this is personal for you, um, just with your family, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I do think we heard a lot from law enforcement throughout this process, though. I think starting back in June, when we looked at S-119, S-219, which really I see as kind of companion bills and um, you know, we heard from law enforcement in the public um, forums that we conducted um, between um, sessions. We, I know that um, our committee leadership was in a lot of consultation with, um, as Representative Grad just shared, with, with um, police, but also with state's attorneys, the attorney general, um, who are other arms of our law enforcement process and I so and you know speaking frankly there was a point um in our committee process this week where I was I was worried that um I wasn't going to be able to support the bill based on based on what I was hoping we would move forward because of the amount of um just the amount of input that we were hearing from law, law enforcement and and some of my concerns about their perspectives um, and how we might act on those. Um, and then, yeah, so I just, I think my perception is that um, this was actually a, a pretty even handed process and that, um, that, that hearing from stakeholders maybe is a little different at times than agreeing with stakeholders. And Representative Morris's, um, former Representative Morris's words keep coming back to me from earlier in this week um, where she talked about just the challenges for um, police, whether at the state or municipal level in kind of enacting these parameters for themselves. And I, I really see moving this bill forward as actually beneficial to law enforcement um, as an opportunity to restore trust. And I understand that many law enforcement officers aren't seeing this bill that way now. And I and I understand why that might be, but I, I, I actually feel like this bill is and should be really helpful to law enforcement to restoring trust with communities that is lost um, for, for a lot of people in this moment. Thank you. Great, appreciate your comments. Okay, uh, Will. Thank you. So yeah, I'm still in my my first term, although it doesn't feel that way sitting here in September. But you know, in the, in the two years I have been on the Judiciary Committee, you know, I have reached back to my um, local law enforcement quite often on bills, and it, and it's really shaped my uh, votes on numerous occasions. You know, I served in local government as the chair of my Board of Aldermen's Public Safety Committee. I've been at numerous meetings in the Rutland City Police Station. I respect and, and you know, 
I greatly honor the hard work that people in law enforcement do. And I have no desire to, to make their job uh, unnecessarily harder. But, you know, this isn't about, and I think we're making a mistake if, if we look at the law enforcement in our backyard. You know, I, I greatly respect the Rutland City Police Department. I think they're doing, you know, an excellent job, but I can't make this about them. This is about the need for consistent standards. Um, sitting where I am in my, my home in Rutland City, um, I am a 15 minute walk away from the Rutland City Police Department headquarters, from the Rutland County Sheriff's headquarters, um, someone in this area looking for their looking for a job in law enforcement, those are options. And 10 minutes in the other direction is the state police headquarters. And there's at least three local law enforcement agencies within a within a 15, 20 minute drive from here. Um, someone in this area who is looking to start a career in law enforcement and, and is trying to, you know, get their foot in the door in one of these agencies. It doesn't matter where they go as they're doing their training, that training should be consistent and there should be an understanding of what is acceptable and what is excessive that they can bring with them wherever they go. This is about having a set definition and set understanding throughout our state. And I think that's the advantage of law enforcement. I think it's the advantage of everyone that they deal with. And I, I know there's some concern about rushing the process. I know there's some concern about, well, why, why, why not push, push it back? Why not wait until, until the next, next biennium? But when you look at everything that's going on nationally, when you look at incidents that, that have occurred in our state, there is a real sense of unease and there is a real sense of discontent among some people and nervousness among others that is making the job of, of law enforcement harder than it needs to be, that, that is casting a shadow on our local law enforcement that doesn't have to be there. So I think when you look at everything going on nationally, when you look at what's going on in our state, the time is now. And the time is now for the people of Vermont, the time is now for law enforcement of Vermont. I really think this bill will move things forward in a positive way for every Vermonter regular citizens, people in law enforcement. This is a good step. It's not the final step, but this is a good step towards aiding law enforcement and establishing consistent practices that can make every member of our state, every resident here, feel more comfortable in their interactions on a day-to-day -day basis with law enforcement. This is an easy yes vote for me. Thank you. Okay, Coach, looks like you get the Last word, I think. Go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Tom, you know, we've been friends a, a long time. And, you know, I understand, um, you know, your connection. You know, I share a similar connection. Uh, I have a brother who was a sergeant uh, in the East Hartford, um, Connecticut Police Force. Uh, and, just some of the conversations that we've been having uh, and and they're almost daily um, about um, you know his concern you know for uh, the climate not not so much the the direction uh, because you know they're working on uh, just like Seattle the 21st century policing uh, uh, methodology, you know, which technically is transformative. But like Ken was saying, you know, there's this this air of distrust right now. And when we have those situations, it's really critical to have clear understandable guidelines that as people look to them they go okay that makes sense now and i i think intrinsically law enforcement over its history has had control of the narrative and when that power structure 
is such that people lose faith, you know, in it, which is the condition, you know, right, right now. A paradigm has to shift, you know, and I, I firmly believe because I've been a supporter, you know, of positive work, you know, and, you know, in my testimony to Senate Judiciary, you know, it was pretty clear, you know, our standards kind of stink right now uh, because we don't have those clear guidelines in place. If you look at the law enforcement agencies that are trying very hard to reconstitute uh, themselves, they're doing it within the parameters of agencies that have been successful, you know, at it. But again, the, there's no uh, clear guardrails. You know, like Bryn, you know, talked about in some of our uh, language changes that we're doing now. And and then there's that other piece at the end of the day when you look at the data and you look at what we got back from our survey. And that was part of the reason for sharing that um, with, you know, all members is even today, I feel nervous driving black in our own state. You know, I, I have a tendency to drive with a full tank of gas because there are certain places I don't really want to, you know, get lost in. And I've been here the majority of my adult life. That should not be the case. And so just imagine some of our, our Vermonters who might not have any confidence whatsoever in how they feel driving in our own state and and that 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 uh title you know driving while black in vermont um it it is not a happy time sometimes you know um but you know, they're, they're, we're trying to shift that, you know, because this is our home and we're all proud of it and we want to be proud of it. And the way that we can help that happen is by changing the way we do business to a degree. Um, and I think that establishing uh, these new parameters and being clear with the public that we're being intentional about it will help build a more welcoming Vermont. And, and that's what we want at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, coach. Okay, Barbara. Um, I will um, be supporting this bill it is time that we move beyond policy. We have seen a lot of local tension in Burlington, which again is just one spot, but the number of deaths in Vermont that have happened uh, in the city of Burlington is pretty uh, telling and it's increased over um, the last decade. Um, I think this bill is a great combination of not being reactive, but also us not sitting idly by and being complicit. And um, for those law enforcement who um, believe in these principles, this wouldn't impact their work at all, um, but it provides teeth to those that don't. And the number of deaths nationally since we started working on this bill back in July even at the hands of law enforcement is chilling. And so um, it doesn't take effect right away. I feel like it is a good compromise of giving law enforcement a lot of time to come back with the policy. And um, I 
have said a couple of times, like if we leave this session and do nothing, I, that will be so unacceptable to me. And again, it's a good balance of not just being a knee jerk reactive um, law. Um, the number of people who had the chance to give input so far even um, is impressive. And we're not just complicitly sitting by here and allowing um, this to happen without doing something. So thank you for everyone's work. Thank you. Okay, so don't see any other hands. We have a motion, second, discussion. Uh, Nader, the clerk commence to call the roll, roll please. Christy? Yes. Colburn? Yes. Ghostland? It looks like he stepped away for a second. There he is. <laughs> what are we doing? Your vote? No. Hashim, yes. Not? Yes. Rachelson? Yes. Seymour? No. Uh, Tully? Yes. Lalone? Yes. Burdett? No. Grad? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I did ask Nader if he wanted to report this, uh, but uh, I think you prefer to speak to the bill, correct? And I think that with um, all the work and hours that Martin has put into this, I think, and, and given the knowledge that he has on the different iterations and the evolution of the bill, over the last several weeks, I think um, he has a greater understanding of all the legal and technical issues um, that may arise during conversation on the floor. Um, but I am happy to speak on the floor in support of it when that time comes. Okay, I appreciate it. Well, I, as I said in my text, you, you got first dibs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so, Martin, and I'm you're it. Work with Martin, however, you know, in, in whatever way is um, can be most helpful for you. Okay, great. Thank you. And what I need you to do is to please, um, as soon as you can, email the uh, clerk's office with the um, with five point one. Um, or actually, do we need to wait? I don't know if we need to wait for it's edited. But if you if you could at least let them know that five point one right, um, passed and what the vote was and that you'll be the reporter. And Brittany, it, you look like here. So I just wanted you to know that it has been edited, so it's oh, ready. Oh, it has. Okay, yeah. wonderful. So then, yeah, so that's great. So Martin, um, you should be all set. So that's that's the version, Bryn, that you uh, emailed uh, at 856? Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I get to to a meeting if it's still happening, and um, really, I appreciate all your your work uh, and honest. And uh, we do have a great committee, and so yes, we do. I thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I, I, I do appreciate you, and I, I won't see you on the floor. A uh, an old family friend passed, and I'll be going to the funeral today. It was. Uh, one of my mother's besties, so. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bryn. Thanks, Lori. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.